Hi, and welcome to this week's Author Spotlight. Today, we are so thrilled to have with us Brenda Biedenkopf, and she is the author of A Quicker Behind the Dream, Charlie Walker and the Civil Rights Movement. Hi, Brenda. How are you today? Oh, good morning, Rebecca. I'm doing great. We have a wonderful snow outside and the sun is shining. I know. I was noticing that, you know, so many times in the Midwest, it's so gray outside during this time of the year. And so I was so happy to see the sun. And I'm glad that you have sunshine where you are as well. And I am so thrilled that you are part of the EA Books team. You just have been um, such a wonderful author to work with. And I want you just to tell us a little bit about your journey with EA Books, how you uh, found us and what your journey has been like been a fabulous journey. It started with a writer's conference in Muskegon, Michigan. Oh. I had just finished my manuscript and it was a hefty manuscript because it had a lot of research in there. I went to a lot of a lot of conferences and this was just the best. I won the prize actually for having the second best manuscript. Everybody, all the writers turned in their manuscripts and were hoping for the prize. And I got second place. I was thrilled. The people at the conference were very invested in me, I found out, because I had won this prize. And they felt that it had it was a mag magnificent or a, a manuscript with promise. Mm -hmm. And so they asked me if I would come back the next year to the next conference the next year and tell them how the process went. Wow. I went back. And I was I was really happy with uh, with the conference. However, they called me at mid mid conference and they said, Brenda, how are you doing at finding a publisher? Because I, I had actually what happened was that the prize was a publishing contract with a Christian publisher. Huh? I worked with them all that year and I found out that I could not work with these people. They were really, I expected them as being Christians that they would be more about what the message was, but it seemed to me it was more about money and control. I had no control over my book, not even the title. I didn't have control over the, the process, not even the price, and they were going to price my book at $50 a book. How many people are going to buy that? Maybe yeah, about no. 10 people who are, who are the diehards. Mm -hmm. I went, I went back to this publisher and a lot of people said, you are not going to get out of your contract. I couldn't. I, I laid it all out and they said, well, you know what, Brenda, we obviously are not going to make you happy. So we are going to refund your money. We're going to take you out of the contract. Wow. I was ready to get a good publisher this time and not make the same mistakes. So at this conference, I was saying, I'm having kind of some trouble to the leaders of the conference. And they said, well, what's the matter? And they said, nobody will touch it because they say it's too large and I have to cut it in half. Well, this was like horrifying to me. And they said, well, you know who you need. You need Sherry Cowell of EA Books Publishing. Make sure that you get an interview with her. And she was on the list of people that I could interview publishers. Mm -hmm. We got together. Sherry looked at my resume, she looked at my manuscript, and she said, this is well written, and I love what you have done with this. And she could see that I had gone out and talked about this. I had been speaking to Quaker meetings, I've been speaking to Black churches, I've been speaking at conferences and Quaker yearly meetings. So they were, so they were thrilled, and she said, I'm going to give you a contract on the spot. And I said, well, what about the length? And she said, oh, no problem we'll make it into two volumes. And I was like, ah, oh, why didn't I think of that? So there I was on the road with EA Books and it's been a wonderful journey ever since. Aww. And I have, do you have a copy of the, the two books with you to show? I sold out of my recent volume that just came out. EA Books was wonderful. And I had a book launch uh, about a week ago mm -hmm. and I sold out. So I, oh. I have some money in the bank and um 
I have maybe I have some volume ones handy, but okay. Well, that, good that news. Is a, that's good that's news. a hard problem. That's a bad <laughs> problem, isn't it, Brenda? That you <laughs> sell your books. <laughs> Every author out there is like, how did you sell out of our books? And uh, <laughs> we, we should do a marketing video someday, but I happen to have your book. So I'm going to show okay. them just for the audience. This is the book cover. It may read backwards just simply because of the way the camera is, but uh, it's got a picture of her father on it. It is a Quaker behind the dream. That's volume one. And then there is a volume two as well. As she mentioned, it was quite lengthy. I remember the discussion about that, Brenda, about being long and that they decided to do it into two books. And I think that's a phenomenal idea. I'm so happy that you decided to go with. What I really want to ask also is why this subject? Why the subject about the civil rights movement? My dad, and I knew this all along, even as a kid, was very much involved in the civil rights movement. He was a Philadelphia Quaker, mm -hmm. and he had studied nonviolence and pacifism as longtime Quaker principles. And so when the civil rights movement got started, he was very much involved and they were working in the civil rights movement from the beginning of the 1900s. The NAACP started in like 1909 before my dad was even born, but many of the groups started up in the 1940s as an antidote to the war that was going on. They said, well, we can't do anything about the war, but we will do something about civil rights and race relations. And a group in, in Chicago actually started that. My dad was involved in, in that process. His roommate in college was one of the founders and they were on the road to get, making things happen in a, in a studied and militant and strategic way with tactics. And uh, this organization was called the, the um, it, it was called the militarization of the civil rights movement. And so they were actually working on the theories, the benchmarks and, and the strategies and the tactics. And so my dad wrote these down and I had seen some of the things he had written and he wrote a book in the 19, in 1960 and published it in 61, oh. a long time ago, but nobody would touch it. So he had to publish it himself but it was one of the very first handbooks. It was the first handbook that was used in the movement. And actually I republished it myself mm -hmm. and here it is. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King had written a letter to my dad saying how great it was that he had done a lot of training in the civil rights movement on these, the benchmarks and the, the strategies and the five steps and how you organize a march so that it is disciplined and the people know exactly what they're going to do. There are marshals, there are leaders, there are spokespeople. The civil rights movement was very well organized. At first, I was starting out to write the story about how my dad worked with Dr. King and worked with more, more um, readily with the second tier of people mm -hmm. like uh, Reverend Abernathy, everybody's sort of Ra Reverend Abernathy and James Lawson, Bayard Rustin, all those people he worked very, very much with. And, and he had a great deal of, he had a great hand in all the civil rights movements that were founded, King's movement, the student movement, the, uh, the, uh, let's see, but not the first one, not the first one before he, he was born. But he was very much involved because he saw it as a possible bloodbath is the way he put it. He did not want to see violence coming out of this. And it was started by Southern pastors who were determined to keep it nonviolent and on a pacifist level. And I do have a story in my book about how, how my dad helped introduce Dr. King to nonviolence mm -hmm. when Dr. King was just a seminary student in the Philadelphia area. Wow. It's a very good story. You'll find it in my book. Wow. Yes. And, and I'm curious, um, what were some of the obstacles that you had in writing this book? I'm sure all, all writers have some kind of obstacle, but what was your greatest obstacle with this book, getting it published? In, in this book, I had so much help. I really argued with God for a year because my mother was saying, look at all this stuff that my, my husband has saved and your dad has saved. And she took me down and showed me a whole recreation room full and his office full of boxes that he had, he had saved because he wanted this written down for posterity. And I said, sure, somebody should write this thing. 
And eventually I realized that God was telling me, this is your job. And I did argue with God because I didn't think I was necessarily the best person for it, but it became very clear. So I started going back to Pennsylvania and working with my mother primarily because mm -hmm. my dad had been uh, disabled with a form, some forms of strokes and heart attacks, and he couldn't talk very well. My mother was just the biggest help. So that's the first thing. She took me around. She introduced me to all these great people and took me to wonderful places that I needed to, to go, like the college where my dad and mom met and fell in love. Mm -hmm. And she introduced me to uh, Reverend James Lawson, a lot of these great people, and even Coretta Scott King's sister, who was her neighbor. I found that the biggest problem in writing this book was white and black people who felt that I had no right to write a story that they shall, should, well, they felt that just black people should write these stories about people in the civil rights movement. It was a very narrow minded view because one quarter of the people in the March on Washington were white people who were there to support and to help. And that, that, that I think is a very important aspect of the civil rights movement and to not discount the white experience in the whole movement. My dad was was right up there on the dais with Dr. King and then in the 63 March on Washington, I was a teenager there. We were all part of it and we all wanted it. And to just say that that the black people didn't didn't do it, didn't have help, which is some of the narrative now, and it's a false narrative that that there were many people helping, not that that they, they're what they're afraid of is white people taking credit for what black people did. We don't want that to happen. But for what actually they did, I said, I'm not going to not write this story just because you don't want me to. But there were some people who, who threatened me, actually, and said, you're not going to write this book and I'm going to watch you and you better look over your shoulder because I'm going to I'm going to look at every word you write and make sure that it is it is accurate and you better dot every I, you know, cross every T because I'm going to be watching. So this kind of thing was the hardest thing in writing the book was that kind of opposition. But there were many others, so many black people, including Coretta Scott King's sister, who welcomed me heartily. And she wrote on a, a book written by her sister that had just come out. Um, it was by Christine Ferris King. And it was her sister-in-law actually. And she said, she wrote for Brenda, who shares the dream that mm -hmm. I was sharing Martin Luther King's dream with everybody and reminding people of what Dr. King stood for. And to her, she said, we need people like you out there speaking. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the reasons why I chose the title sharing uh, about sharing the dream, because it was it's a Quaker behind the dream. Mm -hmm. He was standing behind the dream and supportive of Martin Luther King's dream that we should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. What an amazing, that's such an amazing story. And I think it really is important for our audience to know a little bit about your background and how long it took you. This was a long process for you. So how long did it take you to write this book? And what is your background that helped you with the writing? It took me about a decade to get all the information together. I had to go to Wisconsin, to some archives there. I went to DC. I went to Philadelphia quite often because the majority of my dad's, his uh, archives and his papers were in the uh, Swarthmore Peace Collection at Swarthmore College near Philadelphia. And as my sister and I spent many, many weeks there. And this was a big job because the research was very hefty and I wanted to do it right. I have a reporter's background. I have been a newspaper editor. I started off as a reporter and worked my way up to being the senior editor of a local paper. And that was quite a responsibility. But I found that you go in, you take notes, you go home and you've got to write the story. You don't have a choice. You can't loaf and say, oh, I have writer's block. <laughs> you have to write it up. And I found that I, I found trust your notes. 
I found that I could trust my notes, just write up the notes as I wrote them, and it always turned out to be a very good story. So in all this, I, I knew I could trust my notes, and I did organize it. I had to do a lot of work organizing, and when I finally wrote it through, it turned out to be a very good manuscript. Now, I, I do believe that the journalistic process is a good one to you just go at it and trust the system. Wow. I think that's important for all of our um, other authors listening today. Just trust the system and just the example of your persistence, a decade of gathering research for this. That is amazing, Brenda. Um, so I'm so glad that she brought that up for our audience today. What has been going through this process? What has been your biggest blessing? I would say that there are two blessings. One is being able to go out and speak to so many groups, so many people that I've met that I never would have met before. People in the movement, there were people we did know as they were family friends, they stopped off in our house in Pennsylvania there and I grew up in the movement, actually. I, I, I grew up because my dad and mom believed that we should live in interracial housing developments. And this was, this was quite a blessing, but the writing itself, I lived in the Midwest and all this information mostly was in Philadelphia. As I went to visit my family and I reconnected with my mother, I reconnected with my father. My siblings were so helpful and they took me to all these places, took me to the archives and helped me copy all these things and spent hours and hours dedicating their, their lives to this because, well, maybe it's because they didn't want to write it themselves. So they were very, very supportive and, and helpful to me. But it was a big blessing since I lived in the Midwest and had raised my kids and been very, very busy. I hadn't spent as much time in the East as I would have liked. And especially that my dad knew that I was writing this was wonderful thing before, before he died wonderful for him and, and me both. And then to reconnect with my mother and she took me around to see all these people in all these places. She was just great. She was great. And she was in her eighties, but such a, such a dynamo and so caring and so loving. It was lovely to see. I am, I am so glad that your dad got to see that you were writing this. What did he think about it? And what would he say today along with, with the message that he is highlighting in this book from Martin Luther King? That's an interesting question. I have not even thought about what would he say? Mm -hmm. I have had some of his friends send messages to me for, about the manuscript. And they said, well, Charlie came through with flying colors and you were doing such a good work for your dad and he would be so proud of you. And that's kind of what I'm thinking about is that I think that he would say, Brenda, I am very proud of you. And I'm so glad you carried on this legacy and that you delved into it, that being a journalist, you weren't going to make things up. That's not your not your nature, not to do fiction. This was a nonfiction book mm -hmm. and you did such a great job. And I'm so proud of you and proud of how you not only put Quaker history and civil rights history all together along with my story. And it was a well-rounded story altogether. Thank you so much, Brenda. Now, and I can't, I can't help but imagine that God is smiling down to you and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Because he's always so pleased when we used our talents and the things that he's given us to, to shed light on the world around us. What is the greatest message you want to share with writers today, either about writing or about the book, anything that you want to share just to encourage writers? I would say that the big message that I took away from writing this book is that we need to bring back nonviolence. Mm -hmm. This is one of my biggest messages when I speak today that the people who are going out and protesting and have gone out to protest have not had these tactics, the strategies, the benchmarks, mm -hmm. and they don't know how to create a demonstration where they say, well, it's going to be peaceful. That's really not enough. They have to have leaders who are committed to organizing for nonviolent direct action. And if they would read this book, which of course is included in my other books, they would understand that there's so much to be done. And 
people nowadays are afraid to get back out on the and protest because of the way protesters have been treated by uh, by the authorities lately. And so if they were organized and my dad would tell the press, we are we are committed to nonviolent direct action. Our our people are not going to react in violence. And they did not You could see back when people had had fire hoses turned on them and they didn't react. They didn't fight back. They just they just held held fast. And this is the kind of thing we need to do. We need to have more education. We need to have more uh, training. <clears throat> My dad was one of the big trainers of the movement leaders and the and the rank and file. And he organized huge demonstrations. And he was one of the organizers of the March on Washington because it was so successful because they were or they were committed they were not just oh some you know vague idea of being peaceful they were committed to organizing for nonviolent direct action and that's why they couldn't be crushed like bugs that's why they were so successful and and they were committed to this nonviolence which is also includes a certain amount of pacifism but from writing it i believe this is my definition of nonviolence it is the teachings of Jesus in a practical form. Yeah. Well, Brenda, what, what a great message you have and so important to today. And I am just so glad that you decided to join us today. Thank you. Thank you for your words and for your book and coming to EA Books as well. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. I'm so glad that we had this time together. Yes. And as everyone knows, we try to have Author Spotlight every Friday. So turn in on Facebook. And thank you again, Brenda Biedenkopf, for the book, A Quaker Behind the Dream, Charlie Walker and the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you, Brenda.